Friends in Fire. Welcome to the fifth episode of Pitmaster, an old Virginia smoke podcast. I'm your host, Luke Darnell. Barbecue brings people together from all around the country and the world. People that you've only known for a short time become brothers and sisters, and you immediately get to start having amazing experiences with them. Our fifth guest is the incomparable Fred Robles from Rio Valley Meats. Fred is the 2017 World Barbecue Champion at the World Food Championships the 2019 American Royal Open winner, and 2019 Smithfield National Champion, winning ribs three days in a row, which was such an incredible feat given the competition. Fred runs his own company, Rio Valley Meats, in Texas with his wife, Yachty. So please join me in welcoming my friend, Fred Robles. How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, sir. Been driving all over the country cooking barbecue. Oh, uh, man. Today was, uh, I took uh, most of the day off to recuperate from that long drive. <laughs> well, one of my favorite cooking experiences ever was with you. Yeah. When we cooked at the Smithfield Guinea Pig in Virginia, and we had Tuffy's Double Jambo, and we had Oh, it- that, that was amazing, man. That was bucket list stuff right there. <laughs> we had it on the, on the line between our two cook sites. And- yeah, yeah. You cooked on one side, I cooked on the other, and it was we just had a blast. It was, it was great. I had a great time that weekend. Yeah, I bet you did. You won. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was icing on the cake, man. Everything else was, you know, that whole that whole weekend was fun. You know, it's one of the things that's amazing about barbecue is I consider myself super blessed because in the short amount of time that you and I have known each other, we've done some pretty incredible things together. And, stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, I got to I got to help you a little bit last year at the Invitational, and we've cooked a class together. I mean, we've done a lot of stuff together in a short oh, amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're about a uh, driving time. We're about what thirty five hours apart, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I'm still pretty confident that there hasn't been two. Two men who have been as good looking as us that's cooked a cup class together. Oh, that's just a lot of barbecue sexy, buddy. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a ton. <laughs> so one of the things that I've learned cooking next to you and then being with you in the trailer is that you are you are one of the most confident pit masters that I've ever been around. Where does that confidence come from? I've been doing this for a little while already and 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 uh, to me I don't know. I don't know if it's confidence that you're seeing or what it is, but I kind of just don't let things bother me a whole lot. You know, when things go wrong, I mean, it just it doesn't sway me. It's it's so much. It's more of okay, what am I going to do to fix it than than sit sit there and and kind of just dwell on it. I, I think if I sit there and dwell on it, it's going to be more of like okay, well, I'm losing time. What I'm not doing anything to fix it. Yeah. So to, to me, the the confidence part is comes in the ability knowing I'm prepared for this. I, in my mindset, just to get to a contest, uh, my mindset's already, I'm, I'm there to win. I'm not there to, as, as ugly as that sounds or as cocky as that sounds, I'm, I'm there to win. I'm not there to do anything else. So uh, I think my abilities speak for themselves. You know, we've had, we've had some success in different areas that we've been to. And some of the confidence carries there, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things that I find interesting about cooking barbecue is that sometimes things don't go right. And that helps you further down the road. Do you have a do you have a competition fail that's a favorite of yours that really helped you learn something and really pushed you further on in cooking? Like you said, there's a lot of times things don't go <laughs> right. I, I feel like competitions are about fixing more stuff that goes wrong than than things that go right. Yeah, um, and and I think that separates you know the guys who do well and the guys who don't. Yeah, I've had many a competition fails. You name it, man. From uh, missing turn in, and I'm gonna blame that on being that I was sick. <laughs> From missing a turn in to to dropping a brisket on the ground at San Antonio Rodeo, arguably one of the biggest cookoffs in Texas. I literally dropped my brisket on the ground. I was taking it to to wrap, and it just fell out of my spatula. Hit my. I tried to save it by hitting it by <laughs> by catching it with my foot. Didn't work. <laughs> So needless to say, that one didn't score very well. It was a little gritty. Had some asphalt on it. <laughs> I mean, competition fails as far as I always try to see the positive in everything that I do. 
if I if I look at failures, it's just gonna you know bring me down. I always try to try to say, okay, well this happened. What can I do to make it better next time, or not let it happen again? You know, there's been a lot of things kind of kind of that that we look at, it and and as usually my my drives are long, so the drive back home, that's kind of what's going through my head. Like, okay, well, this happened. That's what are we gonna do to fix it? What are we gonna do to make it better next time? Yeah. What do you think has been the most surprising thing to come out of competition barbecue for you? You know, going into competition barbecue, I wasn't so much. It was more of uh, getting together with my brother-in-laws and seeing who's got the best barbecue between us. Mm -hmm. I really didn't expect all the friendships, the camaraderie. That was a whole aspect that kind of made me fall in love with it even more. You know, I got into competition barbecue really just to kind of promote uh, our meat shop or our, our butcher shop we cooked a bunch of meats handed out flyers you know handed out samples and stuff at at a local comp here and that's kind of why we got into it we ended up hitting a fifth place chicken that at that contest our very first contest out and it was about 150 teams you know just hearing your name called to the stage was pretty incredible but you know it, it was i guess the friendships that came from it was probably the most special thing that and that has come out of competition barbecue that i really wasn't expecting you know, I wasn't expecting I'm I'm not your social butterfly going around talking to people and this and that, but I'm I'm glad I did get into it because I've met great people like you and I, I can say literally that I have friends all over the United States, all over the world for that matter. I mean yeah, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that you know that, that follow me and I follow and, and we talk and I can I can pick up a phone and call you in in Maryland or or I mean in uh, where you at Virginia, <laughs> the Virginia I'm Maryland. It, 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 it's all did that. It, outside of Texas, they're all the same, man. <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia. Oh God! I, <laughs> I remember that conversation we had one time with. <laughs> that, that's a whole other show. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> there is no Western Virginia. Yeah, where's where, where's West Virginia? <laughs> Where's Western Virginia? <laughs> you cook a lot in IBCA, and it's a, it's if I'm not mistaken, it's a growing organization. Uh, what what advice would you give to a a young cook that's about to enter the real world of competition barbecue? Uh, first of all, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by you know the fancy pits you're going to see, the fancy rigs, uh, you know all the money that people throw at the sport. You can win with a trash can or a drum or a pit from Walmart or a Weber kettle. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to the things we do. If your barbecue's good, it's good. It's going to score. It's going to do well. So that'd be one of the things that I'd tell them is don't be intimidated. I think another thing is don't overthink things. We tend to, in, in this world of information that we live in, you know, social media and YouTube and videos here and videos there, it's really easy to get overloaded with info and this guy's doing it that way and another guy does it a different way and at the end of the day we're stuck between okay well, which way do i do it do it the way you know how to do it and then work from there there's it's a learning process it's, it doesn't come overnight backyard barbecue and competition barbecue are two totally different animals you know mm -hmm. what you and your family consider great food might not be that great <laughs> you know your friends are always going to tell you it's great why because you're giving it to them for free uh, try selling barbecue, then you'll really find out if <laughs> what people think. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just don't overthink it. Keep it simple, man. There's middle of the road barbecue. I've always told young up and comers, middle of the road barbecue is where you want to be. You don't want to stand out too much. You don't want to offend too many people with different flavors or weird flavors or anything like that. So keep yeah. it simple. That'll take you a long way. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. Let's switch gears here a little bit into you know you mentioned all the fancy rigs and all the different kind of pits that you see out there. What's one of the best investments you've made into competition barbecue? Best investments that I've made in competition barbecue. You know, when I started, I started with an offset that uh, an offset smoker that, that me and one of my employees built. He, he knows how to weld a little bit and we just kind of slapped a couple pieces of metal together and, and we started, uh, we started cooking on that pop up tent, you know, one table, keep it minimal. And it was rough, you know, it was, it was rough to the sense, I mean, our summers are brutally hot down here. So cooking in the summer was, was not a whole lot of fun. No restroom, no AC, no running water. No. So when the opportunity arose, we bought a trailer. You have the 
the comforts of home there. You've got a refrigerator, you've got a restroom, you've got a sink to wash your dishes, you've got beds. That's been a probably, that's helped a lot to where as much as I cook, you want to have the comforts of home. So yeah, I'd say that the trailer's probably been uh, the biggest investment that I've done. Yeah, I'd have to agree. We cooked in a contest where it was like 32 degrees and we were, we turned the bottom of a Weber Smoky Mountain into a fire pit so we yeah, could just... Yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. It's almost fun sometimes to go back and do that, right? Just to, sometimes. Just to yeah, sometimes <laughs> when the weather's nice, but not when it's, um, when the, when the rain's blowing sideways and you're having to, <laughs> having to hold on to your canopy with dear life so it doesn't fly away. Yeah. But yeah, the trailer definitely helps. Well, do you have a purchase of a hundred dollars or less that has really positively impacted your competition barbecue life? You know, I, I wasn't a believer in many gadgets or electronics or anything like that. And I, and I still, for the most part, are not. To me, probably the biggest thing that I use, and it's just a reference tool, would probably be like a, a shuffle arm, you know, uh, which is a leave-in probe. And I call it a shuffle arm. That's the Thermo Works brand, I guess. But there's Mavericks, there's Dots, there's uh, there's all kinds of brands out there that probably do the same thing. So those, those guys run about 50 bucks, $55, somewhere around there. And, you know, you can leave it in the meat. It's got a wire that sticks out onto a little, you know, a little screen. With, you can set different alarms like your high temperature, your low temperature, your time. You can monitor your internal temperature of meat that way. And, you know, that helps you serve as a guide to where you want to start checking your stuff. You know, you don't necessarily have to take stuff out of the foil to check it. You can probably just go right through the foil or with the probe in there. You can know what your temperature is at. So, yeah, that's that's helped out a lot. I mean. 50 bucks, 50, 60 bucks, somewhere around there. I think that's a, that's a game changer. Without that, now I might be a little lost. <laughs> <laughs> I rely on them so much now that uh, it, it'd, be, it'd be hard to cook without it. My Jambo looks a little bit like a spider sometimes. When it's yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got uh, IV, IV lines running to all pieces of meat. <laughs> People walk by and stare at it, and they're like, what? That. Yeah, I'm like don't even worry about. Are you a are you a, a single color guy? Or you have like different colors for different meats. I have different colors for different meats. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're pretty consistent from contest to contest. I'm pretty steadfast that the blue one has to go in the brisket. Yeah, it just has to go in the brisket, and that's and then I I bought one of those smokes that has the four different pro. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it just threw off my entire thing mm-hmm. and i was like i gotta go back to the individual ones <laughs> the single probe ones yeah those are the ones i run to yeah yeah you, i mean they're just essential now to my life <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's kind of the way the way i'm at too with those guys you put it in the brisket you put it in the pork butt or or whatever else and then you just kind of you don't have to babysit it as much as you would you and know? but i think it's also important while we're talking about this this isn't a show where we really get into too much cooking stuff like this. But when you do use those types of things like chef alarms, it's important to, I think one of the most important things to remember is that you have to probe that piece of meat in the same place. You have to be, yeah, you have to be consistent. If you're going to poke it in the flat one day and then in the point another day, well, obviously it's going to give you different readings because one cooks faster than the other or what have you do it the same place every time. And that way, you know exactly the way that piece of meat is cooking every time. Yeah, and, uh, and you'll be a little more consistent that way. That's so important. Consistency is important. It's, it's everything. So, who has impacted your life the most in competition barbecue? There's several people. Of course, when I started, it was 100% IBCA. I never, I never did venture out to do a KCBS until the year I, I autoed into the Jack uh, winning seven contest here in Texas. I didn't know what the heck to expect at the Jack. All I knew that that, that everybody would talk about the Jack. And uh, I said, okay, well, I better learn or at least do one before the jack to see what what the heck to expect. But I guess in in getting into competition barbecue, I've got a good friend of mine, Hector Villanueva, Killer V with the the V uh, barbecue down here from South Texas that him and his brother and his brother-in-law are a team and just kind of getting into it. They kind of took me under their wing, mentored me. More than anything, they were just good friends to me. And, and, you know, we could bounce ideas off each other. Hey, I'm trying this or, hey, I'm trying that. And for a while there, we were, it seems like back in, uh, I don't know, 2014 or 2015, it was like he was GC, I was RGC or I was GC. They were, you know, because we were kind of running very similar stuff and their schedule is a little harder because it's three of them. And to get their schedules to, to land on a cookoff date 
at the same time is is tough. But <laughs> I'd say them. Another gentleman by the name of Gusti Harina also helped out a lot. We, you know, we we uh, I know we went to a couple classes together. You know, and just like I said, just bouncing ideas off of each other, stuff that he's tried or they've tried that they're gonna tell you it doesn't work. Like, don't even waste your time going there. Right. Um, outside of competition barbecue, that one of the, one of the people who influenced me the most in barbecue was my dad. You know, growing up, just and he never did dwell into competition barbecue, but just you know, fire management how to run a pit, make sure you got clean smoke, stuff like that, that still today is true. If you want to win in competition barbecue, you can't have dirty smoke. Right. You got to run a clean fire. You got to, you know, make sure your pits are clean. Again, going back to consistency, you start with the center, start the same way every time, clean out your pits, clean out your fireboxes. If you go from one contest to the next with a dirty pit, well, then now you're, it's going to change. There's going to be some funky flavors in there, especially if it catches on fire with that grease or whatever. But, you know, there's been a lot of people. There's There's been people who have influenced me without them even knowing. People that I've that I've always, well, I won't say always, but when I got into the competition barbecue that I that I would see on, on YouTube or on TV, Ernest Cervantes is one of those guys. I, I remember seeing him on, on Pitmasters. Uh, now he's like a brother to me, which is pretty cool. But him being a Hispanic like myself and doing what he was doing, it was it was really cool to watch, you know, his success and everything he does. And he's just a he's just a cool dude, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know him pretty well. And then guys like Tuffy and Darren who who are, who've been killing it out there forever. Just watching them and like I said, they, they might not know the influence they've had on me, but just watching them and trying to get to that level has been an inspiration to me and a a want to do better to be in those shoes, you know, to be considered with those names maybe one day. You're working pretty hard towards that. Yeah. We're, we're trying, brother. We are trying. We're knocking down doors. <laughs> and, and I mean, uh, you know, it's I just got chills just thinking yeah. about it. You know, I think I know the answer to this question, but what was the bi- biggest turning point in your life as a pit master? I think there's been, there's been uh, I guess you're asking the biggest. <laughs> I mean, you can mention a couple for sure. Well, there's a couple, man. You know, there's, of course, you, you think of the big ones and, and they're they're great, right? You think of, you know, winning World Food. You think of winning the American Royal, which we won last year. You think of winning the uh, Smithfield Invitational, which we won last year. I guess last year was a pretty good year, huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, one, one of the, one another one is, you know, winning Team of the Year in IBCA, winning uh, Team of the Year in the, in the Texas, in all Texas sanctioning bodies. Yeah, uh, put together winning team of the year there two years in a row was pretty special. One of the ones that sticks out, and and he doesn't do them anymore, but my oldest son used to do kids key. Oh, you know. So there's a there's a competition down here uh, about 15 miles from where I live. One of the biggest contests in Texas called Smoking on the Rio. So in 2015, I won Smoking on the Rio. I granted it that that day. Earlier in the day, my son had done the kids queue and granted it. Uh, so he granted the kids queue. I granted the, uh, the overall. And then the next year we come back to defend our titles and kids queue is always that kind of in the middle of everything that I'm doing. But I said, you know, what? I'm going to go watch him. So I went over there and watched him while stuff was cooking in my pit. I said, I'm going to go watch him. And he ended up winning again. He won the next year, 2016. He won it. And I was like, Oh, the pressure's on Fred. You can't, you can't let him <laughs> win a few. <laughs> So uh, luckily, man, and thank God, I ended up winning. Uh, ended up winning the uh, the contest again the second year. You're talking about 200 teams to win to win that contest back to back like that, and have my son win it back to back like that was pretty special. That, that, yeah, that's 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 pretty special. Um, that that's one that always sticks out. Uh, as far as turning points, you know, the Royal man, the Royal winning the Royal opens all kinds of doors for you. It's just pretty special to win that guy. And it's not its not just what happens at the Royal between friends. I mean, we had a great time those couple of days we were there. But everything that comes after it, you know, uh, with different opportunities that arise. And it's just been its just been magical, man. It's been a pretty cool ride up until this day. I mean, that's one of my top five barbecue moments that doesn't involve me winning something is yeah. was being there in the front of the stage and, and them calling your name. And just that was just <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll yeah, never that, forget i'll never forget it i'll never oh, man, it was it no nah, that's one you it's just special and I, I can i can still remember just sitting there and and travis was right behind me and carlo necked on my side and we were kind of way in the back i, I got i got to awards late uh <laughs> we we're way in the back and then just roddy a good friend of mine was i don't know about 
a hundred yards away from me sitting with his family and I don't know how, but after they said Rio Valley Meat is Grand Champion, he was one of the first ones there. I, I wish I could have seen him rant, run, but <laughs> him and, you know, everybody just, you know, giving hugs and crying, and I was crying. I was bawling like a baby, man. So I was wearing my glasses, but I was bawling like a baby. And it was um, uh, one of the coolest things I've ever seen was all of the Texas pitmasters stayed afterwards. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what I was going to get to is a lot of the Texas guys just stuck around till, till everybody was gone. And I remember Yadi, well, you helped me in the, uh, on the Saturday cookoff. Uh, so Sunday comes around, we end up winning the open. And so my wife wasn't with me. My family was, I, I, I went solo the last yeah. year to the, to the contest and my phone was dead, man. <laughs> at awards. My phone was dead. I left it in the trailer charging and it's, it's one of those things that you kind of want, but you never expect, right? You never expect it's going to happen that way. And so I'm, I'm coming down from awards and I'm like, I need to call my wife. I need to call my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if you look at that picture closely, it's still out there somewhere. If you look at that picture where, where all the Texas is around me, yeah. I'm actually on the phone with everybody around me. Finally, somebody got a hold of my wife and I'm telling her, I just won the Royal. <laughs> <laughs> And she's, and she's like, I know. She was at church. We had there's a Sunday evening service back home, and she's like, I just walked out of church. <laughs> it was pretty awesome, man. And just, you know, just to have all those all those guys that are from Texas just show you that love, man. Is and not just Texas, man. Everybody else who was there, yeah, uh, is pretty pretty special, man. It was pretty so, cool. Man. Yeah, absolutely. I know some of these about you, and but I'm going to ask this question. And sort of expecting an answer, but what habits and rituals and routines have you established for yourself during a competition? You're a pretty superstitious guy. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's certain things that I do that I do every time. One of the things that I do all the time is I never clean my stuff at home. Like, like my trailer, I won't clean it at home. My pit, I won't clean it at home. I always get to a contest and do it at a contest. That's when I pull up to a contest, I unload my pit. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm cleaning my trailer on the inside. I'm sweeping, I'm mopping, I'm wiping counters down. I'm cleaning the restroom. So I've got all kinds of cleaners in there. Do you think that that puts you into a mode? Does that help you get into the mindset? Well, that, that, that just helps me feel better about my environment. That just, uh, I feel comfortable because I've got a candle on that smells great. You know, it just, you know, it just gets you into into a certain mindset, I guess, as opposed to being in a dirty trailer all day and it's just clutter everywhere. And it just, it would just drive me nuts. Yeah. So I do that. That's one of the first things I do. Most of the time I'll take meats trimmed. A lot of the times I don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just depends on how late I'm running or how, what I had to do during the week. But uh, like chicken and, and pork, I'll always take turn trimmed. I don't want to be doing that. But ribs and brisket, I don't mind trimming on site. So you know my brisket trimming music. <laughs> I guess that's that's what a ritual. That I, what that's a ritual that I have. <laughs> you know what it is, Luke. You can tell it. It's all right. It's is all it, right. Now, now the world's Mayer? gonna know. Is it John Mayer? Yeah. My body is a wonderland. Yeah. This brisket is a wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> we need to we need to change the words on that one. That would be great if he would actually record that. That would be right. Cool. Yeah, that would be cool. We need to <laughs> hold it down there. <laughs> if you don't clean anything at home, what is your what does your competition planning look like? You know, the week of a competition. Do you have an organizational chart? Do you have a list of things you do every day? I say yes, but most of the time it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> uh, to me, sourcing meat, I look through what I have at the shop. If, if I think it's it's good competition quality that's going to help me win, I'll, I'll, I'll grab it from there. If not, I'm outsourcing meat wherever I can get it, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be grocery stores or wherever I can get my hands on it, I'll go, I'll go get it. I, whatever gives me the best opportunity to win. Uh, my briskets come from Midland Meat Company, so those are shipped to me. But other than that, now we're, we're using a Tyson Ch- Chairman's Reserve Pork, so those get shipped to me. Chickens I usually grab at the local grocery store. And then, then I'm looking for stuff, you know, your napkins, syrups, butter, you know, the, the same stuff everybody else uses. Yeah. So 
uh, as far as the week goes, usually Mondays is my recoup day from the weekend. <laughs> uh, so Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm looking for stuff. Usually I'm on the road sometime Thursday or Friday. Everything I, I, I pretty much have everything in the shop, so it makes it pretty easy for me, like uh, wood and charcoal and uh, everything that I need. So I just grab stuff from the shop. Uh, a lot of the times I'll just drag the trailer over there mm-hmm. and just load the trailer the morning of a contest and take off from there. So, you know, and that's another thing. Having the trailer helps out a lot because you, you have everything there. I mean, you don't have to be unloading and loading all the time. Yeah, that's it's a huge, huge help in keeping things together. I mean, also, like, I know I cook week in, week in out with my wife. And I know you cook a lot with Yadi. And mm-hmm. I know that I just couldn't do it without her. And that's one of the things I think we're going to do on this podcast is uh, Kim's going to interview teammates Yee! and talk about us. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> that might that might that might not be good. <laughs> Yadi, Yadi says I'm a different person when I compete. <laughs> I know that I am, and Kim says that. It, she says that the only thing I'm OCD about in my entire life is when I'm in that trailer. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything else is a disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm probably the same way. I just don't, I just don't see it because it's me, right? Right. Right. One of the things that that I think is is special about cooking barbecue is that when you get a gut feeling to do something that maybe it doesn't fit with where you are and what you're doing, but you have this feeling you should do it. How do you relate and process those gut feelings? I try to listen to them, whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. You're not going to find out to the end, right? Right. But if if I don't listen to it, then I want to be saying, I should have done it, you know? (laughs) You know, a lot of those gut feelings to me are, are stuff that you, how can I say this? Stuff that you, have probably that you probably already know to do like a gut feeling to me would be something like man i should probably pull, pull that brisket out because it's already got too much color on it or right uh, or maybe wrap the ribs because x ever you know that's what i would consider a good feeling and and most of the time you gotta i got i i listen to them you know it's it's i do it just to do it i, I don't know how to explain it man it's just when you have them just do it <laughs> Has there has there ever been a time when that didn't make like the gut feeling made zero sense at all? Do you have a specific example of that? Yeah, like finishing stuff off on different pits for me. Sometimes, shoot, I did it this past weekend in Georgia. I had brisket already, you know, in the Cambro, mm-hmm. and I always I always bring it out just before turn in, just to set sauce on it, glaze up outside and set sauce, and and I always put it back on the jumbo on the microwave shelf to set sauce. And this time, my Weber had some some coals in it, my Weber kettle. <laughs> I said, huh, let me put it on the Weber kettle. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> I figured I'm in Georgia. Maybe they like <laughs> grill like that. over here. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it. Um, I think we ended up second on our table and the scoring was a little off that weekend, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't blame it on that. But second on our table, I'll take it. I, I don't know yeah. what place we ended up, but brisket was good. It had that drummy flavor i guess you know yeah that grill flavor yeah yeah so it, it was good that's why i love barbecue you know it's like wow this this doesn't make sense but i think it might make sense today you know and and that kind of stuff you know it, it's and it's a swing and it's either going to hit or miss you know and that's kind of the way i felt this past weekend i was like okay i'm gonna swing for the fences let's see what happens yeah well i have a series here of uh rapid fire questions to to get us to finish this up here, what do you see on about barbecue on social media that upsets or bothers you? Oh man, just the negativity, buddy. Yeah, negativity with uh, sanctioning bodies, with scoring systems, with you name it. The people are. I don't know if it's just the lack of them not getting the results they want, or the lack of. You know, it, it seems like everybody behind a keyboard is is braver than when you get them in front of you in person. Nobody says anything. You can ask them a million questions or call me and explain to me what's going on. They never will, but get them behind the keyboard and they're, they're Mr. Know-it-alls. Yeah. So, and that, and that's not, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hurting our sport more than anything, you know, Absolutely. all the negativity and, and, and people don't want to be around that. I don't want to be around it. So yeah, that's one of the biggest things that I think is. I wholeheartedly agree. What is one of your favorite pre, during, or post-competition meals? Pre, I don't really have one. Whatever. When I'm on the road, whatever. During, I really don't eat during the comp. Just whatever I taste. Uh, but after, usually when I'm here 
you know, in Texas we have Dairy Queens. I don't know if you guys have Dairy Queens over there. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Dairy Queen goes hard after a contest. So wherever we're driving and and and, and we uh, we stop. My wife Mod just pizza. my wife just chimed in and said Mod's Pizza. Mod Pizza goes pretty hard too. Yeah, <laughs> pizza or, or Dairy Queen tacos, man, for me and a and a tropical blizzard to go. Tropical <laughs> blizzard. I was gonna ask you what's your favorite blizzard, man. I'm the cooking yeah. guy. I'm a, I'm a tropical guy. You know, it's not even on the menu anymore. They used to have it on their menu, but some some pl- places won't make it for you. It's tropical blizzard has bananas. It has coconut. It has pecans. And I don't know what else in there, but it's pretty good. I, like I remember that I've had it's been a long time since I've had a tropical because I'm a cookie dough guy. I mean, that's is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I love tropical, man. That's that's my go to right there. <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite present that you'd like to give to people? <laughs> my favorite present that I like to give to people is my smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving, Fred. Keeps on giving, buddy. The gift that keeps on you call me cheap, but <laughs> what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about you? Not sure, not sure, man. Um, my wife says that I always look like I'm mad. <laughs> uh, it, she says uh, I always look like I'm mad, so I, I might not be approachable. But I, I mean, you know me, I'm the most approachable guy ever. I'm just a big old teddy bear, man. <laughs> <laughs> If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it that millions or billions of people would see, what would it say? Man, uh, one of my one of my favorite quotes from one of my buddies, Clint Swindoll, here in here in um, in Texas. His on every on every post, he always posts posts good food, good friends, good food, good life. Uh-huh. You know. Uh, and that to me just makes sense, man. You have good friends surrounded by good food. You're living a good life. So that would be pretty cool. Wow. That's great, man. That is fantastic. Well, Fred, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be on here. And can you tell people where to find you online? And if you want to give a shout out to your sponsors, that'd be great too. Yeah. Online, you can find me, Fred Robles on Facebook or uh, Rio Valley Meat BBQ. Rio underscore Valley underscore meat underscore BBQ on Instagram. You can follow us there. Shout out to my sponsors, Midland Meat Company. Some of the best beef you can buy on the planet, man. They're they're just a a great family run operation that have uh, took me under their wing. And and I really appreciate them for that. Tyson Foods is is another great partner of ours uh, providing, you know, a great pork. Tyson has everything. They got pork, chicken, and beef, man. Chairman's Reserve Line is Top of the line stuff. Uh, if you guys haven't tried it, it's really, really good stuff. Traeger Grills. Traeger has been good to me. That's a that's a great organization, great company, great products. I love them. I use them in competition all the time, and I I, I carry one with one with me. As a matter of fact, I had one fall tip over in my trailer. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, that's another story. It tipped over, but I picked it right back up. My <laughs> shelf is gone. It's pretty dinged up, but it worked. <laughs> That's all I, still ran, I still ran it it cooked Traeger Grills Western Wood barbecue products we use their pecan logs and everything that we do so Western Wood's a good uh, another partner of ours Big Papa Smokers of course uh, Cooking for Kids that's a great program if you guys don't know about that program Luke you're on it yep. uh, Cooking for Kids you know uh, our charity uh, down here in, in the Rio Grande Valley has benefited immensely from this program and just it just feels good, man. It just feels good to give back, even if it's not our money, but we've earned it through our barbecue ventures. And to use barbecue as a stepping stone to, you know, to to enrich people's lives like that is just is just great. So Big Papa Smokers, hats off to them for doing what they do. Uh, for the kids. Who else am I missing? <laughs> I don't know. If I'm missing you, I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> All right, Fred. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with me, and uh, I look forward uh, to seeing you again. Are you going out to the KCBS World Championship thing? That is the plan, buddy, if you're going to be there. I will be there. I will. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll be there in November, so God willing, it still happens, hopefully. Hopefully. It doesn't get canceled like everything else has. <laughs> you know, we'd be at the Royal right now. Well, next week, I guess. Next week, I know. I'm trying not to think about it. It's yeah. such a great time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. you get to be champion for another year. Hey, that's a hey. We need to do a whole new press release. Uh, 
I just need a whole other. You retain this crown. <laughs> I, you need to have a whole other cardboard cut out of you in the store. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, we need a. We need a. What do they call those? Uh, uh, the fat heads or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need one of those man, for sure. All right, man. Thanks a lot, Fred. Hey, Luke. Appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you for listening to Pitmaster, an old Virginia Smoke podcast. Be sure to subscribe and like the podcast, rate the podcast, and share it out with all of your friends. Also, be sure to check out the Old Virginia Smoke YouTube channel as well. We'll have a lot of good new videos coming out here in the next couple of weeks. We will see you next week with Charles Cridlin from Wolf's Revenge, one of the most consistent pitmasters over the past three years. For companies interested in advertising, please contact Old Virginia Smoke directly via www.oldvirginiasmoke.com. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is edited by Chris Sedanka. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is a property of Old Virginia Smoke, LLC. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020. OVS, Old Virginia Smoke.